All right, I can start with a brief introduction and then we can go into your speech if that's all right. Sure. Okay, Professor of Law Eugene Kontorovich is one of the world's preeminent experts on universal jurisdiction and maritime law, as well as international law and, and the Israel-Arab conflict. He is also the director of Scalia Law School Center of the, for the Middle East and International Law. Professor Kantorovich has published over 30 major scholarly articles and book chapters in leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals in the United States and Europe. His expertise is often sought out in, and quoted by major news organizations such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Haaretz, and so many others. With that, please welcome our speaker, Eugene Kantorovich. Uh, hi, good morning to you all. Um, I'm in Israel right now, so it's very early for me, and uh, I'm very pleased that you're uh, spending your Thursday evenings. Is there any chance we can switch to a different view where I can see people? No? This is what I'm going to be seeing? Unfortunately, no. I was told this is how we're doing it, by camera. Okay. Well, um, you look beautiful, camera on cam campus uh, picture. Um, the... Uh, hold on. Okay, so um, very pleased that you're spending a Thursday evening uh, here. We're going to be discussing questions about Israel and uh, international law. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. It's a little bit um, disconcerting for me not to be able to see your faces and reactions. Uh, but I will just uh, assume that you are just, uh, following along perfectly, uh, unless you say otherwise. Okay, so uh, one of the perennial questions uh, surrounding Israel is the idea that Israel violates international law by its presence in Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank. Uh, and any discussion of Israel is inevitably... Uh, wrapped up in legal terminology, more so, I think, than um, any other similar conflict. So you, you hear Israel's occupation of the West Bank. That's a, a legal term. You hear about settlements, illegal settlements in the West Bank. So these are all legal terms. Um, and the, the difficulty with confronting such arguments when you're a college student, or really when you're anyone, is that they are put in a technical language, right? They don't just say, well, Israel's, the fact that Jews live in the West Bank is bad. That's a moral claim. And everyone has moral intuitions and you could argue it. You could say, well, no, why, why would a liberal progressive person think that it's bad for people to live next to an ethnic group just because uh, the other ethnic group doesn't like them? We wouldn't think that in America. But by putting it in legal terms, uh, they make it into a technical argument where you need to know something about international law. And the problem is uh, most people don't know how to evaluate an international legal argument and thus just have to take it uh, sort of on expertise. Um, now, most international law experts also have not been so good on the score of Israel, but at least they can speak the language. So the basic claim is that Israel's presence in the West Bank, which uh, it retook from Jordan in 1967, uh, is uh, illegal, is, um, and that Israel has no rights in this territory. From that flow further uh, conclusions and statements that um, anything Israel does, uh, including simply not evicting Jews from this area is also illegal. Okay, we're going to deal first with we're going to deal with the big issue of borders, the question of who has sovereign rights in Judea and Samaria. We're going to do this. We're going to show you something about how to think about any legal claim that you hear about Israel during the current uh, attack that we're facing now. Uh, you're going to hear many arguments about Israel's use of force. Israel did this illegally, Israel did that illegally. And so since you can't, I can't teach you in this uh, brief event everything uh, about every international legal issue facing Israel, I want to teach you how to think about it. And here's the basic methodology of international law. Um, it's actually largely the methodology of law itself. Uh, can we see hands? How many people want 
to uh, well i guess i won't see your hands anyway can i say how many uh, how many people want to go to law school do, can we do the hand raising thing okay. unfortunately i don't think that's en enabled but i do know a bunch of the people here are able or are trying to go to law school myself included okay well first of all um what i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna give you some insight into the methodology which should be helpful secondly don't you're mortgaging your life away um make a instead okay the how do lawyers think lawyers think by inductive precedent that is to say you want to know what's the rule uh in a particular case and so you bring together legal materials in our case this could include statutes uh, pardon treaties but often you know it's vague right and so then you look to precedent that is the central thing that lawyers look to. They look to precedent. How were things treated similarly in other cases? Similarly in other cases. What's the so you look outside, you have a case you're trying to decide, dispute between two parties. You don't look what the parties have said between themselves or what other people have said about that case. You look to other prior cases. Right? Very simple. Very simple. Now, the problem with, the Israel, uh, with anything touching Israel is we, it, uh, the international discourse has created what I would call a closed legal universe of one, where when you talk about Israel, all the only precedents you talk about are relating to Israel. Those aren't really precedents. That's trying to decide the case from the case itself. Okay, what am, another way of putting what I'm trying to... Um, uh, ah, okay, very good. I'm going to just take a little pause here. Uh, Neura Erika claims that Israel is obliged to use police power to restore order rather than military power for self-defense. Now, Neura Erika is a colleague of mine at George Mason University. She's on a different campus. I've never seen her. She's also uh, the niece of Saib Erika, the... Uh, recently deceased, uh, prominent Palestinian politician. So a claim like that, what would be the first way? Just think, how would you evaluate it? What would be the first thing you ask? Well, do other countries limit themselves to using police power to, when responding to disturbances? And can you think of other examples? Now, in fact, we don't have to really think uh, very long. Well, right on January 6th, the National Guard was called up to deal with the disturbances in the capital and the current disturbances in Israel are arguably much more severe, including uh, far broader unrest and greater casualties. Uh, you know, if you look at disturbances in other countries, in France or other countries, are the military ever called out in uh, issued places of major unrest? The answer is yes, of course. So the, this is trying to invent a rule that does not apply anywhere in the world. Because from some, an international obligation has to be respected internationally. Otherwise, it is fairly made up. Okay. So the, the question of Israel's borders. The, the wrong way of trying to approach, approach such an issue legally is to look first at Israel-specific issues, like to say, ah, there was an armistice agreement in 1949, what's the status of the armistice agreement? There was a general assembly resolution, uh, resolution 181, the partition plan before Israel was created. What does that do? Because that's focusing in on the, on the facts before you know what the le relevant legal rule is, right? In law, what you're, what you're taught is how to separate legally relevant things from legally irrelevant. And how do you do that? You first need to know what the law makes relevant. Okay, I hope that's clear. Let me, okay. So as it happens, so Israel became a country in 1948. Mm, as it happens, there is a rule of um, international law that deals with the borders of new countries. Now, this does not often happen, but this is a rule of customary international law. That is, it was not created in a treaty, but it is almost, it is universally respected and universally applied amongst countries 
uh, and it is used to determine the borders of pretty much any country where there is a dispute from Africa to Asia to Europe. You can take your favorite new country uh, and even try this at home and see if this is going to work for its uh, borders. It has been recognized as a, the governing rule of international law by the International Court of Justice. And if you open any textbook on international borders, talk about borders of new countries, this rule is going to be taught. Uh, is the rule. Okay, so that's a good place to stop. It's a good place to stop. Um, and the rule says like this. And by the way, why is there such a good and clear rule, like such a robust rule in international law for this? Usually international law does not have very robust rules. Uh, the answer is because new countries are formed fairly regularly, right? So there's, it is not uncommon for new countries to come into existence when the United Nations was created, there was maybe uh, 50 some members. Now there's 193. And the first thing you need to know when there's a new country is what are its dimensions? And if the rule for determining borders is not absolutely clear and easy to apply, what you're gonna wind up with is constant war uh, over every aspect of um, uh, over uh, every aspect of the borders, because that's how countries resolve disputes. Okay, I'm going to tell you the rule. Again, notice, I know you're here to talk about Israel. Notice I'm not talking about Israel. Why? Because we're trying to understand what international law says about Israel. And you can't jump to just what people want to say what, about Israel. You have to first figure out what the law is, and then apply it to Israel. But first you need to know and in any of these questions, you have to say, imagine the country wasn't Israel, right? Let's put, show me where it would say that for another country, this is the rule. Okay, when a new country is created, and this means not when a new government is formed in an existing country, uh, but when a country comes into being in a territory that was not previously an independent state, but usually part of a federation, empire, or any kind of a larger entity. Uh, you guys are in California. Okay, I'm going to use an example. So um, the uh, so the rule says like this: when a new country comes into existence, the borders of the new country are the borders of the last top level administrative unit in the territory. Uh, the last top level administrative unit in the territory. Um, even when those borders, and what's the point of this rule? Because it's definite and precise, right? You know what the borders of the last top level unit were. This is opposed to saying that the borders are going to be determined by considerations of where ethnic groups live, because ethnic groups are never perfectly contained within geopolitical borders. So that would require, so any kind of ethnic borders require constant redrawing of borders. So you want stability and you want predictability. Say so whatever were the borders before of whatever was there, those are the borders now. So what's a top level administrative unit? In the United States, a top level administrative unit is a state. So for example, if your state decides to um, secede from the United States, um, creating some kind of People's Republic of California, um, what would be the borders of this new entity? So it, you could say that there may be some kind of uh, culturally conservative farmers up in Shasta County, up north, who wouldn't want to be part of this new great experiment. I say, no, 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 we want to be with the rest of the US. Tough luck. It doesn't go by what any of the people in particular want or who they have more in common with. You go by the administrative borders. Alternatively, you might have some kind of hippies in Oregon who are like, oh, we like this idea. We want to be part of it too. No, Oregon's separate. Everyone with me? That's a top level administrative unit. Let me give you some examples. This is how the borders of pretty much uh, all new countries, of all new countries in the world, have been um, drawn up. And crucially, this applies even when it contradicts notions of ethnic self determination. Okay, so take Crimea, for example, as Vladimir Putin did eight years ago. Uh, Crimea was uh, part of Ukraine. The international community to this day 
regards Crimea as part of Ukraine. But let's ask why. Is it because the people there, well, we hear about Palestinian self-determination. Is it because the people in Crimea are Ukrainian? No, mostly they're not. They're mostly Russian. Is it because it was always part of Ukraine? No, really to the contrary. Uh, is it because the people there want to be part of the Ukraine? No, most of them almost certainly prefer to be part of Russia. Not like the 95% that uh, Russia said in the, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the poll that they, in the plebiscite that they conducted, but certainly a majority. 95% is just the only number that comes out of Russian uh, ballot result, ballot machines. Um, so if you win, it's always by 95%. The, so they want to be part of Russia. So why does the international community regard it as occupied? Okay, the answer is this principle of uti pothedetis juris. Um, the Soviet Union was composed of what were the top level administrative units in the Soviet Union? Soviet Socialist Republics, right? That's what the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The two largest were the Ukrainian and Russian uh, Soviet Socialist Republics. And Crimea was part of the Russian one, as it had been part of the Russian Empire for many hundreds of years. However, in the 1950s, the uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, redrew the internal borders and put, gave Crimea essentially to Ukraine. He didn't ask the Crimeans, he didn't ask the Russians, he didn't ask anyone. Right? He was the dictator of the Soviet Union, he did whatever he wanted. And it didn't even matter to anyone because everyone was still being governed from Moscow. But when Russia, when the Soviet Union collapses and Russia and Crimea and Ukraine become independent, Crimea is within the administrative boundaries of the Ukrainian Socialist Republic, and thus it automatically becomes part of the borders of Ukraine. Now, of course, the people living there say, hey, no fares. Why should we be stuck with Ukraine when we want to be part of Russia and we were part of Russia and we're historically part of Russia? The answer is, no, no, we don't go back and we don't look. We don't check who wants to be where. That would be a recipe for eternal war over all borders. We go with the borders of the last top level administrative unit, period. And that is especially and certainly the case with um, countries where the last top level administrative unit was a um, League of Nations mandate. Right? Mandatory territory is, a, is one of the forms of top level administrative units. So take, for example, um, Lebanon or Syria. Both Lebanon and Syria were mandatory territories under the League of Nations, just like Palestine was. They were not natural creations. Lebanon was created by taking a territory called Mount Lebanon around Beirut that was uh, predominantly Christian and adding some sort of countryside to it to create modern Lebanon. Um, the territory that was added on by the French uh, was mostly uh, Muslim, creating a Muslim minority in a majority Christian state. The Muslim minority said, no, we want partition, we want separation. We want a Muslim Arab state for ourselves. We don't want to be in the same country as the Christians. Nonetheless, that did not happen. And the borders of Lebanon become exactly the borders of the mandate. Um, why do the Kurds not have a state, even though they much deserve one? Um, because the borders of Syria did not include a separate Kurdish or Druze state, even though that idea had been played with at various times. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, he didn't just invade it like Saddam just saying, I'm a bad guy, I'm invading, right? That's only in the movies. He had a serious claim. Iraq was also a mandatory territory. And he, would, he did not like the southern border of Iraq as determined by the British mandate. He said it was unfair because Kuwait has all this coastline and Iraq has 10 times more people, but no coastline. So they said, mandate, shmandate. Who cares about these century-old colonial borders? Right? It's unfair. I'm going to fix it. International community said, no. doesn't matter if it's unfair. It doesn't matter if it's colonial. The borders of the mandate are the borders. Uh, indeed, there's only one context in the world where the international community suggests that mandatory borders should not be the borders of the future, of the country that is, is subsequently created because they say it's a special case. 
And that case, of course, is the Jewish case. Special. Um, so, but let's apply this rule to Israel. Mm, let's apply, what was the previous? Um, so Israel was created in May 1948. What was there before? What was there before was the territory of mandatory Palestine. And the borders of, if you ask anyone, like in um, January 1948, before the creation of Israel, where are you located? Like, what is the entity here? They'd say, they wouldn't say Israel. They wouldn't say like Arab Palestine. They would say um, mand mandatory Palestine. And the borders of mandatory Palestine are the borders uh, that uh, run from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean and include all of Judea and Samaria. Also, Aza, though that now becomes a separate question after the disengagement. It is true that the United Nations in 1947 recommended, said it would be a good idea to split the territory of the mandate in two after it had already been split in two between Israel and Jordan to sort of further subdivide the Western part to create another Arab state. Now that recommendation was non-binding because the General Assembly has no power to make non-binding uh, uh, recommendations. It was phrased as a recommendation and it was rejected by the British and it did not happen. For the application of the Yuti Paridetas rule, the only thing that counts is what are the borders at the time of independence? Not what did someone think the borders should be, like the United Nations had this suggestion. Um, so the borders, and by the way, by the way, it's very clear, Jordan. How did Jordan come into existence? Jordan itself, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, was part of the mandate for Palestine. And the mandate for Palestine provided that it could be split into two parts, one on the Transjordan, the east side of the Jordan for an Arab state, and the other um, on the west side for a primarily a Jewish state. Uh, and that is how Jordan was created. There was never any other country like called Jordan or resembling Jordan uh, in that territory. And you know, the borders of Jordan are very strange, right? Jordan has this arm that sticks out weirdly into Iraq. That's not a natural topographic or demographic border, but nobody doubts the legitimacy of Jordan's existence or its borders, which are entirely created by the exact same mandate that created Israel. So if you accept Jordan with its current borders, you have to accept Israel. Now, of course, what that means is that when Jordan invaded Israel in 1948 and occupied the West Bank, it was occupying territory that was Israeli sovereign territory. And the mere fact that it immediately occupied it um, did not get, does not give it any sovereign rights because under the UN Charter, you cannot acquire territory in an aggressive war. So it was that just means that the West Bank, when Jordan was when Jordan uh, during the Jordanian rule, was just Jordanian occupied territory, and when Israel retook it, it was retaking territory to which it had a sovereign claim. I can give you more examples of exa how this principle works on cases that are identical on their facts to Israel. Take, for example, um, the um, Nagorno-Karabakh War between this summer between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, um, in which many more people died than in the current Israeli-Arab conflict, but about which you probably heard one one millionth. Actually, there's a lot of Armenians in LA, so maybe you guys have heard something about it. Uh, but uh, generally has not been a question of major interest. In this war, Azerbaijan took territory to which its only claim was Yuti Potidetis. That is to say, it had been part of the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic, but Azerbaijan has never controlled it because it was immediately occupied by Armenia when they became independent. So like the West Bank, it was a territory to which there's a UT part of that is claim, but over which there was never control for a 20 year period and where no Azerbaijanis live, only Armenians there. And Armenians have certain historic claims to it, but not UT put it as claims. So, um, in a war this summer, Azerbaijan captured much of this territory and are now going to move Azerbaijanis in. Nobody says that this is an occupation because even though they've never controlled it and there's no Azerbaijanis there, only Armenians who don't want them, it is part of the previous top-level administrative unit, the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic, and thus it becomes part of Azerbaijan. 
Um, does Israel now because Israel thus has a prior sovereign claim to the West Bank? When it retakes it from Jordan, it's not occupying territory that doesn't belong to it. Right? It's retaking its own territory, and that means there's no occupation. You can't occupy your own territory. Right? This is self-evident. It's also clearly spelled out in the U.S. Um, Defense Department Law of War Manual. Occupation is when you take an enemy country's territory. So this means there is no occupation. It means the Geneva Conventions do not apply to this territory. It means there's no reason to even think about uh, any questions regarding settlements. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Um, I th can we, should we take some questions at this point? Sounds good to me. Yeah. So I can ask the first question to get the ball rolling and then we can go into the audience questions. My first question would have to be East Jerusalem. I've been hearing so much about it lately because of the current situation. Some people say that uh, the UN Security Council have deemed it an occupation under uh, the principal Uti Posterior Juris. It's not an occupation. What's going on? What is the international law surrounding this? Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm, I want to make absolutely clear, the, it, the United Nations has deemed pretty much everything about Israel um, illegal, uh, going back to the very idea of a Jewish state, where in 1975, the United Nations deemed that Zionism is racism. And the United Nations has called Israel an occupying power um, so many times. Now, just to give you an idea, that maybe it's not a law that's at work here. Uh, I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, with, a, with a student of mine, uh, maybe five years ago. At that time, I believe we counted that the United Nations had used the word occupation to describe a country, occupying power, occupation, some 2,000 times, 2,600 times in all of its history. All but 16 of those references were to Israel. Now, you may not know it if you just listen to the UN, but in fact, there are occupying powers out there in the world, even today, Morocco, Turkey, Russia, uh, Armenia, well, many. And certainly there have been many in the, since the creation of the UN in 1945. Um, so the, uh, you know, that should make you suspicious from the beginning. Uh, but the United Nations is a political body and people have a mistaken view and you, you need to know about international law to know, to know this. The United Nations is not a legislative body and it's not a judicial body. It does not write law and it does not interpret it. It's a political body which makes uh, statements about its views. But those view, those statements are not conclusive. The question of whether there is an occupation is under the Geneva Conventions called a question of fact. Either the conditions, right? there's a treaty. So what are the sources of international law? Primary source of international law is treaties. Countries are buying themselves through agreements. The relevant treaty about the law of war that determines what constitutes an occupation is the Fourth Geneva Convention. It provides certain conditions for an occupation. Namely, you have to take the territory of an enemy country. The West Bank was not only not the territory of an enemy country, it was Israel's own territory, which does not fall within the scope of the uh, law of war. You can't self-occupy. So the pronouncements of UN bodies are diplomatic expressions which um, can't negate the meaning of the Geneva Convention and are not, uh, you know, and don't have jurisdiction to interpret it. The only time an international court can um, interpret something is with the consent of both parties. Okay, good so question. The next question is very relevant to the note you ended on. David Guy asks, do you think Israel should respond to the ICC in court rather than avoiding it? Uh, no, Israel should not re respond to the ICC at all under any circumstances um, whatsoever. Because wh wh why do you respond to a court? Like if you get a summons, um, why do you respond? You respond because... Um, because they have jurisdiction. But the ICC, it's not a court. It's a political body which is um, engaged in a purely political inquest into, um, uh, in, 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 into Israel. So the, um, there's no reason to reply. And it would only, in fact, um, it, would, uh, it would only, in fact, grant legitimacy 
to their uh, investigation. You, you respond to a court, you don't respond to a political witch hunt. Then the next question is by Zach Brenner. He's asking, can you explain your concept of, oh boy, I hope I pronounce this correctly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's an academic idea I had about um, pirates. So it's not so relevant, but I have an article about it. It's about pirates. I don't want to bore everyone. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next question. Lionel Hazan asks, uh, he just read Catch 67 by Miha Goodman. In the book, he argues that there is no way to ultimately solve the conflict and suggests Israel should give Palestinians full economic independence, but maintain control of security. Do you think that is a realistic solution? Uh, Israel's, Israel, in fact, uh, has. Um, first of all, ultimately solve is a, is a weird idea. The whole idea of solution. People like to talk about solutions. Very strange thing. I mean, nothing is permanent. In the world, um, so uh, I don't know what they mean by solutions. Uh, I think you know what, what, what. What's the characteristic of a solution that everybody's happy? Never going to happen. What's the characteristic of a solution? Um, stability, relatively low levels of violence, economic growth. That's called the status quo, right? We're having a bit of a conflict now, but really, this is clearly the most stable place in the Middle East. And one can imagine it can get, you know, we've seen since the Arab Spring, things can get worse a thousand times, a thousand ways more than they can get better, right? There's this much to go up and in the Middle East, a lot of the way to go down. So I don't know what the problem is that's um, being solved, right? That, that's the first, what's the problem that's being solved? That the Palestinians don't accept Israel, that problem can't be solved. That they're unhappy, that problem can't be solved. Uh, that there's a lot of violence. That's not such a problem. That's not, not actually a problem. That's generally not the case. Uh, past four years have been entirely quiet, I should point out, completely. Last year or two were like the only years with like no terror casualties. Um, the, um, the, the Palestinians have a government that governs them in every single way already. Uh, the only restrictions that they face are restrictions based on security. And no matter what the political arrangement is, Israel would still have to make security restrictions. Take, for example, the current war, right? How does Israel govern Gaza? It doesn't. It left. It said goodbye. That's it, right? Goodbye. We have, we're not governing you at all. Then they elect Hamas and starts shooting rockets. So then Israel has to take measures, right? It has to implement a partial blockade, create a closed maritime zone. As long as there's violence coming from these territories, Israel has to defend itself as is the inherent right of every country under the UN Charter to exercise self-defense. So it doesn't matter whether the Palestinians have an entity, a territory, an emirate, a state, a semi-state, um, a Palestinian authority, if there's going to be violence emanating from there, which is likely, uh, there's going to be Israeli security restrictions. Um, and indeed, what we've seen so far is there's a direct correlation with how much autonomy Israel gives the Palestinians and how much Israel has to impose restrictions based on security, because the autonomy is used to perpetuate violence against Israel. So consider, someone mentioned um, checkpoints, I think, or Israeli restrictions in the West Bank. There were no checkpoints. There was no wall, apartheid wall, as they call it, until the Oslo Accords. That's the funny thing. The making of peace with the Palestinians is what created all these restrictions, because the Palestinians used the autonomy and freedom they had with the creation of the Palestinian Authority to create a terror regime, to create a security apparatus that brought weapons that were used for terror, uh, and that created the Second Intifada. And Israel had to respond by defending itself. Um, the, so, so that's part, in fact, of the Palestinian strategy to use whatever autonomy they can get to inflict pain upon Israel, to require Israel to impose security restrictions on them, to say, oh, look, they're oppressing us. But uh, whether, uh, you know, that would be the case regardless of what the form of government is. There are very few Palestinians in Area C, and I think for, that there's really not what, what to speak of there, uh, because Area C was drawn with the goal of having as few Palestinians as possible. Uh, now, many of them are trying to move in there to try to prevent, um, try to sort of surround the Jewish communities there and prevent any kind of uh, territorial um, 
separation. But that also suggests it must be not so bad for them to be in Area C. I hope, was that, a, was that an answer to the question? Uh, yeah, I think that was a pretty good answer. Uh, and no, then... let, me, let, let, let me say uh, from um, the, I put in the chat, not in the Q&A, someone said something about apartheid. I put a link to a paper um, I have written about that. Uh, I think the apartheid allegation is just so ridiculous, there's almost nowhere to start. Uh, uh, do the people in American Samoa live under apartheid? You know, they're not allowed to vote in U.S. elections. They're not citizens. They're U U.S. people, but not citizens, and uh, they can't vote. Um, but uh, the people in the uh, Palestinian Authority have it much better. They vote for the Palestinian elections whenever they decide to, to have them. That is to say, what do we say? What's the American motto? No taxation without representation, right? You're not independent if someone taxes you. Uh, without your uh, input. But Israel does not tax the Palestinians. It doesn't draft the Palestinians. It doesn't make their curriculums, their education, their cultural material. Uh, its only interaction with them is uh, in a manner of uh, security and self-defense. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Brenner says, Palestinians have time and again rejected offers by Israel for land. When, if ever, will they accept um, yes, I mean, they have accepted it, um, uh, they have, uh, 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 they have accepted, um, they've rejected so many offers, uh, it's actually striking because I, again, it's always good to look at the Israeli experience in a comparative setting. And when you look at it in a comparative setting, uh, it's, it's even more amazing because there are many, many national independence groups around the world. That is to say, ethnic armed guerrilla groups that want their own country from the Kurds and the Uyghurs and whatever, the, the IRA, there's literally, uh, there's a few hundred major ones. None of them have ever, first of all, they're very, very rarely succeed enough to be offered a country, to be offered independence. How many national independence groups have ever turned down an offer of independence? As far as I know, in modern times, zero. Now, again, the denominator is very small because no one gets offered independence. But uh, the, um, to turn down independence because of a small territorial, because you're not getting everything you want, shows that you don't really want independence. And uh, again, I put on the chat an article I wrote exactly on the subject. Uh, what's going to be on the future? Well, I think the best predictor of the future is uh, the past. So what, what do we know? We know what the Palestinians want. They want all of the trappings and independence of statehood, which is what they now enjoy, without the responsibility and without, you know, what, with being able to continue to blame Israel for all their problems. So right now, their status quo perfectly positions them for that, which is why the status quo remains the status quo. That's why they pick the status quo over alternatives, because they prefer it. And I think they're going to continue preferring it, so we're going to continue seeing the status quo. Well, the only thing that could change that is if a uh, progressive government in the United States overwhelmingly pressures Israel to make suicidal concessions, and Israel, in a moment of uh, rashness, uh, does. I think that's really the only thing that might change the status quo, and that will be bad, in my view. So I'm not seeing any other audience questions, so I'll ask another one of my own. I think that we've all heard more than enough about Sheikh Jarrah from a social justice point of view. I'm very curious about it from an international law point of view. I don't know what there. I mean, about I don't know what there is to say about it from a social justice uh, point of view. Because uh, is there social justice in not letting people who own property uh, use and live in that property simply because they're Jews? That's the situation. Sheikh Jarrah's property that has belonged to Jews for over 100 years. Uh, and where, and when in 1948, when Jordan took over Eastern Jerusalem, what did they do? They expelled all the Jews and they seized their properties. Uh, and they let where they didn't mind as various Palestinian squatters moved in. So when Israel retakes this territory, there's Israelis who have title to this property and they want to use it. How harsh has Israel been in kicking out these squatters? I kid you not, the plaintiffs have been in court trying to evict them for 40 years. 40 years. 
And every single court case in 40 years, and there have been many, have confirmed that the people living in these places have no rights to them whatsoever. They have no title. They never paid anyone anything for it. And that it belongs to the, uh, um, the current uh, Jewish uh, plaintiffs. Uh, there's no the laws that they're using are totally ordinary laws. They're, they're making they're suing under Israeli property law that an Arab would sue if he has a property dispute. And the only argument against these plaintiffs being able to take the land is that they're Jewish and it would Judaize the neighborhood. Right. In other words, these human rights organizations are trying to turn anti-Jewish apartheid into a human rights issue. Right? The only reason that they're opposing these groups. Nothing about you know their title or how they got their title. If the title wasn't you know held by an Arabs who wanted to assert it, of course Arabs can evict Arabs, but Jews can't. Jews cannot have problems. And the idea that Israel has to deny Jews their clear property rights in its own capital uh, is uh, is disgusting. Uh, it, it's an attempt to justify a new kind of restrictive covenant. Right. Imagine if in America we said that you know blacks shouldn't move into a certain uh, group because it would inflame in a certain area. It would inflame tensions, like Peace Now says, inflames tensions. That's racism. Um, later, um, I believe tonight. Later tonight, I'm going to have online in the Wall Street Journal an op-ed discussing this more extensively. God willing. So the next question is again from Zach Brenner. What are your thoughts on Biden's response to the situation in Israel right now? Um, his response has been very mild. Um, so far, so good. Uh, I think it's a, what you would expect from most U.S. administrations. Uh, I mean, really, the question is, what do we not know in, is going on in the background? That is to say, the typical U.S. response in such cases uh, is, uh, has been um except under the trump administration when really like there were no actual there was not such a level of violence has been you know you of course you can defend yourself but we don't like these headlines so finish it up fast so how much pressure there is for israel to sort of accept an early ceasefire before achieving its goals we don't know we saw that uh, biden said something like he hopes that like israel finishes this soon but how you know? Of course, Israel will finish it as long as it takes to finish. I put again in the chat a uh, paper that we have produced about the Sheikh Jarrah issue, in, detailing in great length the legal issues. Uh, you guys should follow me on Twitter so you can be up to date on all of the um, answers to the latest questions. E V Kantorovich at uh, E V Kantorovich. Yes. Um, the um, so, I, but I think the the response of the administration has been uh, has been mild, um, but the U Israeli reaction has been extremely mild. Right, there have been maybe a hundred some casualties in in Gaza, given that they've killed uh, you know dozens of Hamas members. The precision of these strikes is extraordinary, and clearly Israel is holding itself back from strikes of the kind that would be lawful under international law. Under international law, even um, you know. Uh, even a military strike that kills, you know, uh, 10 senior uh, officers, but kills 50 civilians could, could be legal, right? if there's a legit, legitimate military objective. So Israel has avoided, uh, has really been obviously tying its hands behind its back in a way, uh, and I think that may be one reason why the U.S. response is so mild. And then the next question is from David Guy Rishi Gerara and international law. He asked to please discuss abandoned property in Israel. Why shouldn't Arabs recover their property in Israel if they had title before 1948? Oh, okay, good question. Uh, Arabs are treated exactly the same way as um, Jews. There, there's, no, there's no distinction. There are two different situations. So when in Sheikh Jarrah, we're dealing with a Jordanian seizure. Right. So in 1948, Jordan occupied the area and it seized all of the Jews' properties. Now, it, uh, it seized them because they were, it expelled the Jews, like every single last one. Um, the, they didn't run away. You know how you know whether people run away or they're expelled? You run away because you're scared. And usually not everyone is scared. So like some people run away, some people stay. That's what happened with the Israeli Arabs. Uh, most stayed, in fact, right? The, uh, in Jordan, 
all the Jews were kicked out, every single last one. And Jordan seizes the seizes their property. Now, what do you do with seized property? You don't know how long the conflict's going to go on, right? Jordan thought they were going to have this forever. So they started giving out some of this property, handing it out, like giving it away to Arabs, to Palestinians. Um, and the... Um, and uh, and they, they gave away much of it, most of it, I think, before 1967. Sheikh Jarrah happens to involve some pieces of land that the Jordanians did not actually like give a title to, to uh, Palestinian residents. Everyone with me? Okay. When Jordan gave away, for those properties that Jordan gave away, and they gave away because they thought the conflict was going to go on forever, the Jews aren't here, why hold it in suspense? Israel does not let those Jews reclaim the property. If you're a Jew and your property was taken by Jordan and given over to a Palestinian, you cannot challenge it. That Palestinian is treated as the complete rightful owner by Israel. This is just one of the few, you know, this falls in line, this is a minor, uh, unusual case where Jordan had not uh, given it away. Similarly, now not, or I'd say dissimilar, uh, the uh, Arabs who fled in 1948, first of all, there's many barriers to them getting their land back. Namely, most of them fled to enemy countries and they're enemy nationals. So no country hands over territory, hands over property to enemy nationals. Right? So most of them wound up in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, which have been enemy national countries. Um, the, you know, the reason Israelis can claim against this property now is because it's now not enemy territory and they're not enemy nationals. By the way, the, just, there's no discrimination. What if one of these properties had been owned by an Arab, the property in Sheikh Jarrah? He'd also be able to claim. This is not a law for the Jews. The only reason it seems to favor the Jews is because Jordan only took property from, uh, only took property, uh, from the Jews to give to the Palestinians, which the Palestinians did not complain about. Okay, so Israel also seized as took control of as absentee property, property of Palestinians, uh, Arabs that fled, uh, because again, it became unclear when they would come back. Uh, most of them are enemy aliens. That is to say, they fled, uh, they, they fled to join and fight with an, or support an enemy country during a war, and they remained nationals or inhabitants of an enemy country. That's a big difference. Uh, it's not their citizenship or their ethnicity. But another major, but then of course, Israel did the same thing Jordan did, right? Since it's holding on to all this property, you know, it doesn't know what to do with it. It distributed some of that property to private parties. And just like Israel respects the distributions of the private, you know, the Jews who had the, their property that was seized, given away by Jordan, can't get it back. Same with Arabs who had it seized by Israel and had it distributed, can't get it back. Uh, what would be discriminatory is if Israel distributed Arab property and didn't let, uh, but uh, but then uh, and treated that as final, but then let Jews uh, go against Palestinians who had gotten property distributions of Jewish land from Jordan. But Israel does not do that. And by the way, it's also not true that Arabs can't get that property back. Um, they, in fact, can. There's, there's a process that you go through. The problem is most of it has already. Uh, been uh, turned over to uh, various development authorities, um, but uh, those parts that remain can, in fact, uh, be uh, recovered and have, in fact, been occasionally given over to uh, to Arab claimants, providing that they were not Arab, enemy aliens. So these would be Israeli Arabs. So don't believe everything you read. And then the next question is by Lionel Hazan. What do you think is the best way to counter disparaging claims about Israel's actions in the current conflict? But uh, it's very hard to answer that generally because it depends who's making the claims. Again, a lot of claims are not made in good faith. Uh, the you know like claims like Israel discriminates in like land amongst Jews and Arabs, the whole Sheikh Jarrah thing. These people know better. They make this claim because they know. This notion of people being treated differently on it by basis of ethnicity is inflammatory and like the worst kind of thing you could say about someone in today's climate. So that's why they say it. So it, it all depends. But um, I don't know. I don't know what it depends on the nature of the disparagement. But I could point out that uh, the the level of civilian casualties 
in Gaza now is smaller in the ratio than in most US military operations in dense population areas like in Iraq. One more question. I hear people yelling in the other room about what question to come up with, so I'll give them a few seconds. Oh, sorry. Everyone feel free to come up with a last question or if you take a bit longer, I'll come up with one on my own. Okay, um, I guess I'll come up with a question on my own. Um, how, so what is the international law regarding uh, Something. So I was writing a op-ed for a camera about the use of human shields in Gaza, and I came across this claim that Israel is actually the user of human shields, and I'm wondering how exactly does that work? Because I don't know. I, what, what's the basis of the claim? Um, it actually came from Nora Erekat of all people, where uh, there's actually no basis for claims that Hamas uses human shields, which is questionable since there's been multiple UN reports and such. Uh, she claims that the only sources for these are biased sources such as the IDF and the Israeli government. I don't think fighting with Nora Erika is a useful endeavor. Uh, I mean, she's part of the Palestinian uh, nomenclatura, uh, but um, you know, there's two uses of human shields. There's two kinds of uses. First of all, some of the human shields are involuntary. So that is to say, when you put your military operations in civilian buildings, when you put your military headquarters in civilian high rises, which is what Hamas does, that is using everyone else there as a human shield. Um, also, we've seen sometimes the use of voluntary human shields, like during Operation Castellet, Hamas would instruct people. Now, I don't know if they were forcing them, pressuring them, but they would say, everybody run to the roof. You know, Israel's going to bomb the building and everybody would run to the roof uh, because, uh, and then the Israeli pilots would see them and be like, shit, we can't bomb these civilians. Now, in my view, those people are not human shields, even if they're civilians, because when a civilian per chooses to participate in hostilities, they become a legitimate military target. And why are these civilians running to the roof? They're running to the roof to protect the military target. Protecting a military target makes them a military target. Um, but most of the time, they're not voluntary human shields, and they just happen to live in the wrong uh, place. And then I'm seeing a question by David Guy. At one point, IDF used a child as a shield. The practice was stopped by the IDF. I don't know if that's a question or not. I don't know what you're referring I just don't know what you're referring to. Um, I don't think so. Um, okay. Um, well, I have another question. Uh, could you please talk a little bit about the principle of distinction, which ties into my previous question? Yeah, there are two parts to distinction. Military forces in a conflict have to distinguish themselves, right? That is to say, all military forces have to wear distinctive emblems and say, hey, we're the military. Um, and you can only target military forces. But when you target military or military targets, but in international law, you, you can, uh, it's understood that you can have civilian casualties collateral to the targeting of military uh, targets. Uh, now, when Hamas, of course, is shooting rockets like blindly at Israel, it is not distinguishing. It's just treating all of Israel as one military target, and that's against international law. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you Shabbat so much, Shalom. Professor Kantorovich. This was very enlightening. I have personally learned a lot about international law from this. Please follow him on Twitter. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to this amazing event. Everyone have a wonderful night. Professor Kontorovich, have a wonderful rest of your day and good luck with the article. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you all for your continued support. Take care.
I'm not the host, so I can't end this, but you're free to leave. <laughs> <laughs>